I asked, like, hey, if he's in jail and he's not at the RNC, does he have a video made ahead of time? And one of them told me, why don't you come up to Mar-a-Lago and tell Donald Trump to film a video for his RNC address because he's going to be in jail and see how that works out. For so nobody's got the balls to do that around him? Uh, no. Hello and welcome to the Bullard Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. I'm here with my colleague, Mark Caputo. Mark has been suffering uh, through MAGA World for us. He lives in MAGA World. He talks to MAGA World. MAGAville, I guess what the newsletter is called. You should get the newsletter if you want to know what's happening in MAGAville. What's going on, bro? Nothing much. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm in Atlanta. I was already at the debate site this morning. I kind of want to throw up. I, you know, I used to throw up on debate nights um, before those my <laughs> candidates. Um, I didn't do that in 2020, but I'm back to wanting to throw up a little bit. But um, I want to talk first uh, before and, and, you know, some of these folks will be listening to this when the debate is done. So I want to talk a little bit big picture also about what what Trump world is thinking. But uh, before we get to that, um, I, my Kevin has like it, it, this has gone on the saddest run of any of any politi- post post defenestration politician I think I've ever seen. And, and let's listen to him together on the Jesse Waters show, because that's what he's doing with his time now. There were different moments. Every time I met with him, you got a different Joe Biden. And there's times that he was really engaging. I remember talking to him when it's Air Force One coming back from a, a G7 meeting, and he could tell me all the different meetings he had. He, he was fully dimes. engaged, and the next day I met with him, and it was a totally different Joe Biden talking off cards. So let's not lower expectations. He's going to be prepared the best he's ever going to be prepared. Let's not lower expectations, says the guy who was on a front page Wall Street Journal story about how Joe Biden is crippled with dementia. I, I, why is he doing this? Doesn't he have, couldn't he just go be a respectable post speaker like John Boehner and lobby for the marijuana industry or something? Like, why is he gro- doing this groveling nonsense? What, what, what's happening here? Well, Kevin McCarthy always had the quality of being sort of the, the test tube product of a mad scientist who wanted to create a dishonest, slimy, two-faced, double-talking politician. So the idea that he is continuing to be true to form doesn't really shock me that much. Yeah, the the effort, I think the more, the pathetic, I think this stuff is pathetic, the fact that the Wall Street Journal published his sourcing about about Joe Biden's uh, mental acuity was, 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 I I think, uh, really poor editorial choice. Yeah, yeah, as a reporter, what surprised me is that generally speaking, if you write a story that's attacking a Democrat, yeah. you usually want an admission against interest and have your first quote be Democrats. Yeah. Same thing. Or, if you or have any a story, quote be a Democrat. <laughs> well, there we go. Or Democrat. if you have a, or if you have or anecdotes, or if you have yeah, a story sure. attacking a Republican, you again, you want that admission against interest. You want a Republican saying something critical about a Republican. Otherwise, it's just people are going to say, ugh. Of course, a Republican is going to attack a Democrat. And, uh, and, and, and McCarthy's effort out there to, you know, he's primarying Matt Gates. He's trying to <laughs> primary Nancy Mace. It's just like, it's, it's just failure. It's, just just like, it's like rake after rake he's stepping on. He can't handle the fact that Gates totally outmaneuvered him and booted him out of the House. And all he has left with Gates is he, he's run this poor, sad sack of a guy. I can't even remember his name running against Gates. He's going to get it's going to look like cannon fodder when it's over. And then he's got his pals on the Ethics Commission who are continuing with the sort of Kafka-esque investigation where they continually say, we're investigating Matt Gates for sex crimes. It's like, OK, well, let's see the evidence after two years. Yeah, I, I mean... Again, plenty to criticize Matt Gates on, but I do kind of agree with this. It's like, okay, we've been doing the Whisper campaign on this for, for a while now. Whisper campaign, uh, hell, it's been through a bullhorn. You yeah, know? I mean, oh yeah, good point. <laughs> there's plenty of public things that Matt Gates have done worth <laughs> criticizing. So maybe let's focus on those for starters and, you know, see late for the evidence. Um, uh, the, the, the takedown of his opponent, whose name I also forget, by Kevin Williamson over the dispatch, was one of the most delicious pieces of writing that I've read in quite some time. So I'm going to put it in the show notes for people. Okay. Uh, enough of, enough of my Kevin. Um, uh, so it's the debate. Uh, I guess they do seem a little half hat. It, it seems a little half hearted. This, the whole drug thing this time. I mean, they tried this against Clinton. They tried it against Biden last time, mm-hmm. but I, they kind of feel like they had to do something because they were worried that dementia Joe had set the bar too low. Like yeah. what, what's, What's your take on the whole? I think it's that. And the other thing is, it's just this is just what they do. Right. 
one of the things that characterizes the Trump world style of attacks is they will use any possible attack, even a contradictory one, even from one that are opponents of theirs, as long as it hits another opponent. So that's in keeping with that. If you're looking for consistency and uh, a, a certain amount of, uh, of logic behind it, you're not really going to find it. One minute, one second, one sentence in a paragraph, Joe Biden is a dementia patient. The other one, he is the you know, it's evil Dr. Moriarty, right? Who's a, and by the way, if, there, if this serum exists that makes Joe Biden suddenly spry and everything, like, A, why is Joe Biden not taking it every day? And B, where can I get it? Yeah, it is funny. My, my buddy Peter Hamby was was making this point. It's like, I, I, it's not like this is Barry Bonds like juicing and they're messing <laughs> with the integrity of the home run records. Like, who? Like, do, wouldn't we? If there is some serum that makes our president's acuity a little sharper, wouldn't we want that? Like, what is the? Uh, anyway, the whole. Well, thing I think is, there oh, is that liquid microchip that's been invented by Microsoft. I'm just kidding. Yeah, the whole thing. Oh, oh, oh no, no. Watch out, Magaville, my friend. Yeah. yeah, watch out. You've been in Magaville too long. Um, okay, the um, the the your story on the on the Trump debate prep was pretty delicious. I enjoyed it. My favorite part of it was um, somebody, one of your sources, said that uh, he was working on policy refreshers. What a euphemism that is! Policy, policy refresher. Uh, it's it's a two part euphemism. One, it it implies that he cares about policy and that he needs to be refreshed about that. But two, it implies he's not really doing debate prep, right? Like he doesn't he doesn't want to. Isn't that there's something there? Like he doesn't. They want literally to the will weakness. not call it debate prep. Is it an they, alpha they thing? Say, is that why they they're saying that? Like what's well, the point? They, of I mean, the, that? his position. And by the way, this was Trump's position in 2020. Is that he's already prepared. He doesn't need preparation. You know, all he needs is a refresher to remind him of the things that he's done and his successes and the like. Yeah. Um, but again, it wasn't true in 2020. Uh, famously, he almost killed Chris Christie during the policy refresher with COVID. <laughs> he, he did. And in that one, Chris Christie, uh, while he didn't play the part of Biden and in these debate preps, quote unquote, debate preps or policy refreshers, what makes it different with Donald Trump both then and now is he doesn't have someone who is playing the part of Joe Biden. Mm. But in 2020, Chris Christie was trying to push Trump behind the scenes. He would argue with him. He would yell at him and he would try to get him used to being under pressure. Uh, that didn't work because Trump just shit the bed. And that's actually a direct quote from one of his top policy advisors or debate advisors back then. Yeah. Uh, now it's a different situation. And according to Trump's campaign, he's more relaxed and sort of more able to do it and has had four years to think about how he made mistakes in 2020 and how he actually gets a second chance to have a first debate against uh, against no, Joe Biden again. No reason not to be relaxed. He's been golfing a lot lately. Um, seen a lot of good pictures on, on his social media. Um, uh, you, you put it interesting. Uh, I'm, uh, the, the learning from 2020 is interesting because – uh, you you sent you sent a tweet earlier about that um, I thought was it was not about Donald Trump at all, but I thought paralleled this situation. Um, you were referencing AOC's comments after the Jamal yeah. Bowman loss, which which seemed to indicate that the squad has not really learned a lot from the Jamal Bowman loss, which is kind of crazy because they're like all of these squad candidates that won primaries handily and then one lost, and so you think you might like learn a lesson. Like, what happened that was different in this one? It wasn't like APAC liked the other candidates. Anywho, that's an aside. My question for you is, Has do you think Donald Trump has learned from his losses at all in, in this debate? Uh, I think, do you think we'll see something different. I think in some ways he has, from what I gather and from what he's told others and what they told me he said – is this is not like last time. This isn't 2020. So the Donald Trump who showed up at that first 2020 debate and was just angry, had absolutely no sense of humor left in him or wit or ability to kind of manage Joe Biden, who he thought he was going to push over. From what I have been told, he has been, to the degree Trump is, chastened by that. But to your broader point, yeah, Trump is the one guy who sort of breaks the rule if you learn more from your losses and from your wins. He's just like, I didn't lose. I didn't lose. I didn't lose. And well, here we are. And right now, nominally, marginally, he's sort of, sort of leading uh, Joe Biden in the polls again within the margin of error. But yeah, I want to learn a lot more about that. And I think in the next couple of weeks, um, yep. I'm interested um, in, you know, what, when it comes to the, that side of this debate thing, like that, if Trump, if the lesson from 2020 was that crazy Trump hurt Trump, uh, you know, Stuart Stevens and I talked about this on yesterday's podcast. Uh, it's, it feels like it was the Biden. Do you do we know whether it was the Trump campaign or the Biden campaign that wanted the muted mics? 
do you have you talked does trump world have a have a view on the muted mics because it seems like that I helps trump i haven't checked with trump's campaign says it does help him yeah but trump's campaign says they didn't make any of these in, that insistence they didn't make the insistence on having no audience they didn't make the insistence on not having rfk there a lot of a lot of the, the the wins here as far as the structure of the debate have actually been on the Biden side of what they wanted. Yeah. Now, but Trump's people are saying, one of them told me, like, look, I'd never tell Trump this to his face, but it's good that his mic is muted because it sets up a guardrail and keeps him from sort of crashing off the road or driving off the road. Yeah, I bet Susie Wiles wishes she had the mute button sometimes, um, you know, down there having to listen to him. Feeling overwhelmed by the state of politics? Finding it hard to get motivated? You might be suffering from electile dysfunction, but Pod Save America has got the cure. Talk to your doctor about tuning into Pod Save America every Tuesday, Wednesday now, and Friday for a real talk conversation about the latest, biggest election of our lives and zero old guys yelling at you about the kids these days. Where else can you get that guarantee? Nowhere. Listen and subscribe to Pod Save America on your favorite podcast platform or watch on YouTube. Pod Save America is not approved by the FDA. Okay, I want to back up a little bit um, and uh, talk more broadly about this, uh, about the campaign and like the view from MAGA World. And I was interested, there's a new ad that Trump, uh, the Trump campaign put out this morning um, that I, I want to listen to that together and just see if what that tells us about about where they're going message wise when you think about the joe biden you saw in the debate ask yourself a question do you think the guy who was defeated by the stairs got taken down by his bike lost a fight with his jacket and regularly gets lost makes it four more years in the white house and you know who's waiting behind him right vote joe biden today and kamala harris tomorrow I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. So there are two interesting parts to this. I'm going to get to the Kamala part second. I, I, so they, I don't know if this leaked by accident or if they put it out, but, um, I mean, if you listen to the language, it's, it's an ad to air after the debate. So it's the Joe Biden you saw at the debate. Like, they're basically calling their shot that he's going to seem whatever, not up for it, feeble, dementia, I, I uh, it, what what do you think is what do you think is going on there? Is that just showing that they're gonna no matter what happens to Joe Biden tonight, they're just gonna keep running with the Joe Biden old thing? Yeah, because they believe that there are two things that have enabled Trump to be in this kind of nominal leadership leader position that he's in. One, the economy, and two, Joe Biden's frailty. So this is this is what they're gonna keep hitting and keep hitting and keep hitting. I think what's notable here is the use of humor or the attempted use of humor, depending on your sense of humor. Uh, generally, a campaign that starts making fun of an opponent is following the like one of the rules for radicals of Saul Alinsky about how there is no defense against ridicule. It's your most potent weapon. Uh, very often, uh, campaigns that are in front and feel like they're front runners do this sort of stuff. So it gives you an idea of where they're coming from. What surprised me about the Trump campaign and specifically Tony Fabrizio, the lead pollster and top advisor to Trump or one of them is he is generally a pretty pessimistic guy and he has been very optimistic for many months. Yeah. And I guess it's, it seems to show a level of optimism, I guess, about the debate. I mean, I, you can always yeah. pull the ad down, right? I, you can always pull the ad down <laughs> if like Joe Biden dominates Donald Trump tonight and if Donald Trump like, no, like I don't sh think sharts himself on stage or something. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Sorry, you got me. You know, but no, I don't think they would. Ridicule. Remember, you like, said ridicule is important, so you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can also employ it. It's a two way street. But but remember the, uh, you know, the, there's that sort of Thanos reality stone issue with Donald Trump, where he just comes up with a message and sticks to it. They are going to stick with this idea that that Biden is mentally diminished no matter what. And so yeah, I think even if even if there was a repeat of the 2020 debate, where Trump falls apart and goes nuts and Biden holds his own and, you know, looks OK. I, I think you're still going to you're still going to see the, the Trump campaign hit that. Yeah. And it's notable that Kamala Harris is they're finally bringing her out as the kind of boogie woman or boogeyman or whatever you call yeah. uh, her so, yet or the dynamic. Well, yeah. What do you think the dynamic is with that? Because so Nikki Haley, um, you know, before, yeah. you know, her brief period as a as an attempted trump slayer you know her six weeks in the light um prior to that and now post that like that was her big 
argument, right? Was that, that she's not even running against Biden. She's running against Kamala. I was always, I, I, I found that a whiff gross for a variety of reasons. Um, that, but that's different than what, what I, you know, I think that was a different situation, especially because I mean, she's like losing by 50 points in the primary. Anyway, the Trump thing now, it does. It feels a little bit like a weird time to bring it out. I don't know. I, like on the one hand, I agree with you that like that 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 a ridicule ad gives the air of a team that thinks that they're leading. A bank shot. Oh, you might get Kamala. I, I think maybe betrays a little bit of weakness, though. Hmm. I don't know. What do you, what's what say you to why, why now? Do you think on on this Kamala might be president line, which we haven't we haven't really so heard. Po- well, for my part, and again, this is as someone who who kind of covers the campaign and talks sure. to them and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. day in and day yeah, we're out. We're just looking for your perspective on what they're thinking. Is that what surprises me is that it's this late. Yeah. I'm right. surprised they haven't been hitting this the entire time. Because generally polling has shown generally that her, her favorability ratings are lower than Biden's, and Biden's by like maybe a point or two, and this depends on polls and they fluctuate, have generally been worse or about as bad as Trump's. So in the view of the Trump world and of Republicans generally, uh, Kamala is an easier opponent. I'm not sure that's necessarily going to wind up being true, but that's just generally been their point of their yeah. point of view. So as I said, I just think it's it's surprising it's this late, uh, n- not that it's this early. Yeah, I, I, I guess I agree with that. I do wonder if there's, uh, if there's maybe some reticence um, around, you know, kind of black voters. I, I, do, I do think that Trump thinks that the Trump world thinks that they could potentially be gaining with black men, right? Right. right? Really, it's not men. black women. Right. Um, Hispanic men, black yeah. men, white men. Yeah, black men. men. And yeah. so it's kind of like, okay, well, we don't want to necessarily, you know, we don't want to jeopardize that. But maybe at this point you're in a judgment of like, I don't know, if the black, the types of black men that might be gettable for Trump are probably not going to be the types to be offended by like swipes at Kamala. I mean, uh, you know, we're speaking very broadly here, but, but maybe that was part of the reticence because, because you continue to see this offensive from them. Trump was at the bar. was at a, was that at Trump called into a barber shop yesterday with Byron Donalds. It was a very weird campaign event. It's one of these campaign events. It's the second one they did like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like cognac and cigars. Yeah. It's like, it's like Byron Donalds is in a barber shop with four other black guys and Trump's on a speakerphone. And like Trump's talking about tax cuts, <laughs> it's kind of on regulation cuts. It's like I don't know if that's the prime issue. And then he's talking about like how cool his his mug shot is. I don't know. I mean, you know, well, who the hell knows? I don't know. It seems like this is the kind of thing that if this was the Jeb campaign and we were doing this, and it was like Jeb, if we had our one black surrogate in a in a barber shop and Jeb was calling in on speakerphone, I feel like we would have been just ridiculed by everybody. But like pe- people are are inured to this a little bit with Trump. But I, it, that they definitely are however ham-handed are like really focused on this no well they are and remember this is the second event like this they did one in philly uh it was byron donalds and wesley hunt the texas congressman Hmm. and at that one that's where uh, byron donald decided apropos of almost nothing like you know what families uh, black families more intact during jim crow it's like why did you say that and that created its own uh, stir but yeah compared to that event this was tame Right, this did not produce. <laughs> the, that we didn't sort of praise level. Jim Crow, the Jim Crow South. Yeah, congratulations, you've cleared the bar, right? Um, hmm. okay. And also, if, I, I really wonder if Donald Trump didn't want to go to this event because he doesn't smoke, he hates cigar smoke and the stink of it, and he doesn't drink. What has he been doing besides the I, policy refreshers? Just golfing? He doesn't golfing have a very and heavy, fundraising. And, like they have been doing boatloads of fundraising. Like that's they true. They're in New Orleans. The doors off of it uh, in in May. Blew the yeah. doors off a of fundraiser. Yeah, he was in New Orleans at this rich guy's house, uh, and uh, like a third Romney cousin was there, so I was very disappointed in. I was tisk tisking her and uh, Boise <laughs> Bollinger. Yeah, I don't know. It was a little too close to my home for comfort um, for me. Garden just, District action, yeah, I would assume. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was yeah. all the way up by Ottoman Park, actually. Um, all right, I want to do a little veep stakes uh, before I lose you. Um, so, your last article. I think rightly had had caveats that are like, who the hell knows what Donald Trump is going to do? He like he's going to do what he wants to do. Um, but the conventional wisdom is congealed around Burgum, Rubio, and Vance. Uh, mm-hmm. Conventional wisdom is almost always wrong, and yep. so I'm wondering if what you what you think about uh, about the, where we st- sit right now. You know, once in a while, when you write a story, you you start, you discover things from your own presentation of the facts. And while the insiders generally favor the idea of 
J.D. Vance, the more I typed the pros and cons from the perspective of Trump in picking these guys, it was difficult for me to find enough cons to, to have Burgum match Vance and Rubio. Meaning, I think that... Burgum has fewer cons. Burgum has fewer cons for Trump. And, and while the insiders think it's Vance, I, I, I'm starting to think it might be Burgum out of those three. But then again, who knows? He could pick someone off a park bench, right? It's yeah. Are there any other names uh, that have emerged lately or any, anything Not else that I have heard recently. Yeah. Uh, you know, Trump played one of his games and got the media and the NBC to write this piece about like, could be today or could be tomorrow. And then the campaign mocked it. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if Trump either holds it uh, for whether he gets jailed or not, the announcement. And if he gets through that, like maybe there's going to be a rose ceremony at the RNC at the Republican you, National Convention. What, what, what is, what is there? Uh, well, hold on. I want to get back to the jailed point, but um, I do have just one more thing on Burgum. I, the, to me, the con on the list is, and by the time this podcast airs, I might, there's a chance I might be on TV with a Burgum, uh, a Burgum uh, surrogate today. So, you know, I might be able to get the chance to ask them myself. That could be interesting television, daytime cable for people. Um, but like, it's just the Pence of it all, the Pence element. I don't, I don't look at Doug Burgum and think that like that guy is, you know, like let's say it's, it's fall of 2028 mm-hmm. and, Trump doesn't run again and and Burgum doesn't because he's a VP and you know the nominee is some Republican that is not as popular as Trump and they're getting schlonged by Josh Shapiro or something and Trump is staring down the barrel of a post presidency second presidency where where he's going to be in court again maybe in jail and uh, the next president he doesn't think is going to pardon him and he looks at the VP and he's like I need to create some trouble here are you going to stand with me on whatever I come up with I don't think you look at Doug Bergam and think that guy's going to be solid, right? I mean, he seems a little bit like a milk drinker, a little too much milk drinking from Doug Bergam to me that to, for Trump. Uh, doesn't Trump want somebody with a little bit of a bad boy streak? Well, that I, I'll admit I never considered that specific scenario. But <laughs> you've never considered my fantasy. You know, I, I spend a lot of time in the evenings. The milk, Kuda, just the milk like, drinker, the milk drinker one. I was like, how do I answer that? What, thinking uh, through what 2028 fall looks like. I you think know. I think whoever Donald Trump is going to pick is going to make sure to stick with him through thick and thin to make sure he, that after he leaves the White House, he doesn't wind up in the big house. Right. Yeah. If he can do that. Or, you know, to try to make sure that he winds up in the White House and not the big house. So I think on that count, all three are kind of equal. I do think, and not to be too literary, the problem with Vance and Rubio is the quote from Caesar in uh, in Shakespeare's play where he says, let me have men about me who are fat, sleek headed men and such a sleep of nights. Jan Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. And I think Vance and I think Rubio in the regard of ambition and another quote from, you know, the play ambitions made of sterner stuff. They, when they get in the Naval observatory, human nature is going to take over and their, their ability to not run for president four years. Hence is going to be greatly diminished. I think Bergam will still run for president as well, but he partly to your point, he doesn't seem to have the same sort of like hunger and ambition for it. Yeah, I think Vance Cassius. I have nothing to add to that. The Cassius thing is right. Okay, I got to run. I'm going to do your Miami buddy Dan Lebitard's podcast. If you want some sports debate takes, uh, listeners, you can go check check out uh, Dan Lebitard's show. I'm, I'm going to be on with Pablo Torre, my buddy, today, and uh, and then I'm on MSNBC all day. So I have 30 seconds left for you, Mark. The jail, the jail of it all. Uh, the jail. I mean, do, he might. What go do to they jail. think? Do I, they think he might? Do they? What they do they think? think? He, what do they think? They about? think he won't. And uh, I asked, like, hey, if he's in jail. And he's not at the RNC. Does he have a video made ahead of time? And one of them told me, why don't you come up to Mar-a-Lago and tell Donald Trump to film a video for his RNC address because he's going to be in jail and see how that works out for you. So nobody's got the balls to do that around him? Uh, no. Guess not. A bunch of shoe shiners. All right. All right. I said it. You did it. Okay. Mark Caputo, uh, always appreciate the candid report from Magaville. Uh, we'll be seeing you soon, amigo. Thanks, man.